In Indonesia, football is more than just a game. It's an obsession, and it can be thrilling, intimidating, and deadly. Tim rival, karena ya se di malam pembujitan ni katanya, memang perasaan marah, emosi ya. In October, the archipelago saw its worst football tragedy in history. A stadium stampede left more than 130 dead. Mayat Aremania saudara ku juga di kayak di pelataran gitu. The Kanjurahan disaster was the deadliest incident in Indonesian football history, but not its first. Sepak bola soccer, misalnya sebelum tragedi Kanjuruhan dari 1994 sampai 2022 itu ada 86 orang meninggal dunia gara-gara nonton bola. How did Indonesia gain the reputation for having the most violent football scene in Asia? Supporters of a club might be wearing the wrong colours at the wrong time and end up being killed. And what can be done to change it? It was scared. Surely it was scared. Sugianto, who lives in the city of Malang in East Java, Indonesia, has been a football fan since little and calls himself an Aramania member since grade five. Sepak bola itu suatu olahraga yang aku kagumi, aku, aku senang dan bisa membuat aku emosi, emosi secara aku dan sepak bola ini membuat aku bisa menangis bahagia, menangis suka, sakit hati dan Sebab bola ini yang membuatku bisa satu enak makan, enak tidur. He is an ardent fan of his local team, the Arema Football Club, which is one of the 18 teams in the top flight of the Indonesian Football League. On the 1st of October, he and his friends attended the game at the Kanjurahan Stadium, an almost weekly ritual. But this match was different. Ini lawan tim rival karena se rival pembujitan ni katanya. Arema FC were playing Persebaya Surabaya, a team from another district in East Java. The bad blood was such that Persebaya supporters had been barred from the stadium due to fears of violence, something that is common in Indonesia. The rivalry was so intense that opposing players from Persebaya arrived in a barracuda an armoured vehicle. Leonardo Lelis plays defence for the team. We know that if we have to go to a match with Barracuda, there is some danger around, you know. So, yes, I was scared, uh, especially after the game, because the, we, I could see that the supporters were angry or, or some fanatic supporters, they wanted to reach to, to hit the Barracuda, so that moment was was a bit scared, yes. We went there as a usual match, you know, we went there to play football and come back home as, a, as usual. Even with 42,000 home fans behind them, the match did not go Arema's way. Awalnya sih kita datang ke stadion dengan harapan, membahagiakan, mengharap dengan harapan Arema menang pulang dengan senang kan waktu itu tapi memang kita nggak ngerti hasilnya gimana hanya arema kalah dan waktu itu harus peliwet panjang kita memang pikiran sudah kacau bilang anjing arema kalah anjing arema arema had just lost the match 3-2 
At the end of the game, several fans left the stands and ran to the pitch. We just had a feeling that they would come to the pitch. We, nobody told us about that. No, no one could imagine a situation like that. But as the game ended, we, we just ran into the to locker room to celebrate. But we didn't expect that much of fans coming into the field. Sampai setelah uh, di stadion uh, dalam lapangan bayang turun, aku sempat berpikir untuk turun ke lapangan. Niat saya menghalau anak-anak biar naik ke tribun lagi gitu kan. Sama temanku jangan mas, jangan maju di sini aja. Tolong mas, saya minta satu kali ini turun saya, jangan turun mas. Akhirnya oh ya. Akhirnya aku berpikir juga kalau aku turun orang kan bahasa tubuh mungkin yang di tribun timur tuh ikut turun semua malah malah nggak jadi apa kan gitu aku pikirnya ya udah aku di sini turun jangan yang yang di sini jangan turun dah aku. Indonesia has been called home to one of the world's most dangerous football leagues. The local fans, known as Ultras, have a reputation for violence. In 2018, Haringa a 23-year-old fan of Perisaja Jakarta Football Club, was beaten to death by rival supporters. 16 were arrested, some seen here being made by the police to reenact the brutal beating. Selama ini supporter kita terkenal sangat fanatik, tapi fanatiknya fanatik buta, fanatik sempit, fanatik yang kebablasan. Sehingga kemudian budaya menang kalah dengan menghalalkan segala cara itu menjadi karakteristik yang dibangun dari akar rumput. Nah ini yang berbahaya dari karakter sepak bola kita. Ditambah tentunya sepak bola juga dijadikan alat untuk melampiaskan emosi. Baik itu emosi di rumah maupun sisi ekonomi. Sehingga kemudian supporter kita banyak melampiaskan masalah-masalah ekonomi sosial kulturalnya justru lewat sepak bola. Because of the expectation for violence, police presence is common at Indonesian football matches. And when the fans at the Arema match invaded the pitch on the 1st of October, the police jumped into action. They responded with force, kicking and hitting fans with batons. This prompted more fans to enter the field. Then, the riot police started firing tear gas in the direction of tightly packed stands, fueling mass panic. Kalau kalau ngomong orang kisru, kenapa yang, yang turun aja aja? Kenapa harus di, di, di tribun? Di situ ada ibu-ibu, anak-anak. Jangan kan, gak, gak, gak ada gajet mata kalau kita itu nafas itu juga sulit, apalagi dia nggak bisa cerita lagi menjelang. Among the crowd was 33-year-old housewife Elmiati, who had come to watch the match with her family. Kan waktu itu kan saudara-saudara dari suami saya sama saudara saya kan suka lihat Arema, penggemar Arema. Lah terus saya kan diajak gitu apa? Diajak sama saudara-saudara terus ya saya punya inisiatif ayo ikutan ya demi biar anak saya ini senang gitu loh yang cowok ini gitu. Kalau suami selalu nurut Pak apa yang kayak demi anak gitu loh pokoknya Pak biar anak seneng gitu kan juga jarang-jarang bisa nyenengin anak kan setiap harinya anak kerja pulang malam-malam gitu. Elmiati and her family rushed out of the stadium after the police fired tear gas into the stands. The world's football governing body FIFA bans the use of tear gas for crowd dispersal. But on October 1st, the Indonesian police launched an estimated 45 canisters at the people in the stadium. Waduh kok kayak gini. Saya kan seumur-umur enggak tahu gas air mata itu apa kan enggak tahu. Malah waktu ada tembakan gas air mata saya kira itu mercon gitu loh, Pak. Enggak tahu aku. Kok keadaan kayak gini kok diuripi mercon. Pikiran saya itu gitu tapi kok buat nafas ini kok sakit, perih gitu. Nah, aku ngerasain enggak gini, apalagi anakku cuma pikiranku itu gitu loh. Terus waktu mau ke gerbang itu is kondisi udah dorong-dorongan yang penyelamatkan mau keluar itu 
langsung pisah saya sama suami saya. Padahal itu jaraknya udah deket sama pintu gerbang mau keluar itu udah deket. But the stadium exits were very narrow, only allowing two to egress at a time, and some gates were even locked. This resulted in a bottleneck for the crowd. Elmiati was separated from her family when someone pulled her out of the crowd. Itu ada yang nolong pak. Saya ditarik sama orang gitu loh. Katanya saya itu dikira adiknya. Mas tolong anak, mas tolong. Saya bilang gitu. Karena kedorong-kedorong supporter yang dari atas mau keluar tadi. Sedangkan yang di bawah ini udah kecepet-cepet gitu loh pak. Permasalahan terjadi pada saat telah selesai terjadi kekecewaan dari para penonton yang melihat tim kesayangannya yang tidak pernah kalah selama 23 tahun bertanding di kandang sendiri tidak pernah kalah namun pada malam ini mengalami kekalahan rasa kekecewaan itulah yang menggerakkan para penonton turun ke tengah lapangan dan berusaha mencari para pemain dan official As the panicked crowd pushed towards the exit, around 30 people were crushed to death. Among them were Rudy and Verdi, Elmiati's husband and their three and a half year old son. Terus dari Kanjuruan, dari Stadion Kanjuruan ke Rumah Sakit Kanjuruan itu jalan kan saya sama teman-teman jalan. Kok langsung <coughs> diajak ke kamar mayat gitu loh, ke arah kamar jenazah. <coughs> dari situ saya berhenti pak. Tidak usah di sini naik, Sri. Terus gak enak kan saya. Tidak usah aku tak di sini naik. Ayo, kok masuk gak kepindel anakmu? Enggak, aku masuk tak di sini naik. Enggak siap aku masih anak lihat anak saya. Terus, tak pikir-pikir lagi. Iki lo aku terakhir lihat anakku. Masuk aku gak berani. Masuk aku gak tatap lihat anak. Padahal aku keluar enggak ada. Bayangkan kan ada yang meninggal, Mas. Akhirnya aku balik lagi ke tempat nongkrongku uh, awal sama anak-anak. Ayo kita cari Nawi, alam bau Nawi ke rumah sakit masa aku ke rumah sakit Wafa itu sekitar jam 12-an malam. Ya Allah, lebih banyak lagi yang yang but, oh, yang sak, yang masih keadaan koma, keadaan itu banyak dan mayat-mayat aremania saudaraku juga di kayak di pelataran itu. In the end, more than 130 people died as a result of this tragedy, and it has led to a call to reform Indonesian football, a call that goes all the way to the top. Baik pemain maupun penonton harus terjamin keamanan dan keselamatannya. Untuk itu kita sepakat mengkaji kembali kelayakan stadion dan juga menerapkan teknologi untuk membantu mitigasi aneka potensi yang membahayakan penonton maupun pemain. As the country reflects on what caused this episode and how to prevent it from happening again, one question is being asked. Why is violence so common in Indonesian football? Indonesia is a football crazy nation. It is estimated that two thirds of the country, or 180 million people, will tune in to the World Cup. Domestically, thousands of fans show up every week in passionate support of their local clubs. But the fervor can sometimes go too far. It is common for chants and banners at games to be provocative and insulting to the rival team such as this song about a fictitious grass team. Bante, Bante, Bante siapa? Karena uh, timnya rumput ya. Bante lah rumput, Bante lah rumput, Bante lah rumput sekarang juga, sekarang juga. It's common to hear the phrase, Dibunu saja, just kill them. When I first heard this chant being sung at the stadium, I felt it was quite um, metaphorical, of course, uh, as in just beat the team, 
just just beat the opposition. But uh, of course, uh, it gains an extra layer of meaning when you actually start reading about uh, deaths on the side, or killings on the sides of streets away from gang days where supporters of a club might be wearing the wrong colours at the wrong time and uh, end up being killed. 46-year-old Jules has been the coordinator for Arema FC's fan club called Aremania since 1998. He once counted himself among Indonesia's football hooligans, carrying weapons with him to matches. Strong kan gini, arema lagi, arema lagi. Tapi kalau masa strongnya buat arema sih sampai sekarang tetap kayak gitu. Tapi kita bisa memilih, memilah lah ini yang jangan, ini yang iya gitu. Jules sister, Ninik Winarti, who's also an Arema FC fan, sometimes follows him to matches. Jadi saya ngikuti bukan kaya karena Satu ya was-was, saya ikut biar dia itu beban sama saya, tidak melakukan yang aneh-aneh. Seeing the culture of hooliganism among Indonesian fans prompted former sports journalist Ahmal Mahali and several others to start a local NGO, Save Our Soccer. It aims to improve the sport by engaging stakeholders like the authorities and clubs. It was one of the first groups to highlight that football-related violence in this country has reached alarming levels. Sehingga orang mati di lapangan itu menjadi hal yang biasa. Dalam catatan Save Our Soccer misalnya sebelum tragedi Kanjuruhan, dari 1994 sampai 2022, itu ada 86 orang meninggal dunia gara-gara nonton bola. Of those deaths recorded by Save Our Soccer, Many are attributed to clashes between fans, mostly young men. Seperti dulu Inggris di zaman sebelum modern, mereka punya hooliganisme yang sangat ganas dan sangat berbahaya. Seperti itulah sebenarnya Indonesia saat ini. Supporter kita rata-rata usia 20 tahun ke bawah atau paling banyak bahkan usia SMP dan mereka perlu edukasi. So why is violence synonymous with football in Indonesia? The violence that occurs is uh, often related to uh, unresolved conflicts that have been going on for, for perhaps decades, specifically in the case of uh, the supporter groups of uh, Persebaya, of Surabaya, and uh, the Arema fans in Malang. So you will hear frequently stories that uh, of fans seeking to take revenge for what was done to them and uh, when they've been going on away trips or uh, visiting other stadia. Selain tentunya adalah sosio-kultural masyarakatnya juga ikut mempengaruhi bagaimana budaya supporter itu dibangun. Kita ini terdiri dari masyarakat yang mayoritas ya, menengah ke bawah. Sehingga kemudian budaya supporter kita lebih banyak adalah budaya yang lebih mengedepankan sisi-sisi tradisionalnya. The regional rivalries can get so tense that rival fans are sometimes barred from sporting grounds, as was the case at Kanjurahan Stadium on October 1st. Bagi contoh misalnya, pertandingan Persija Persib tidak boleh ada supporter salah satu tim ketika bermain kandang. Kemudian rivalitas Persebaya Arema juga demikian. Ketika Arema tuan rumah, supporter Persebaya tidak boleh hadir. Nah, kemudian dibudayakan pertandingan sepak bola itu tim yang punya rivalitas tinggi datang dengan barakuda. Ini menggambarkan bahwa sejatinya sepak bola yang dibangun oleh sepak bola eh, oleh Indonesia ini sepak bola penuh intimidasi. Padahal sepak bola yang sungguhnya adalah sepak bola itu hiburan yang menyenangkan, bukan tempat untuk eh, apa namanya? orang-orang itu merasa tidak nyaman, menegangkan dan menakutkan. 
Because of the expectation of violence and intimidation, security forces respond in kind. Maintaining social order is very important because this is part of a police key performance uh, indicator. So if uh, some people are killed and then if it makes national headlines, uh, then of course uh, the officials, the police uh, officer, especially chief of uh, local police officers, they are going to be removed from uh, positions or worse, they are going to be prosecuted for a uh, criminal uh, reason. So basically, uh, they couldn't just uh, sit and watch uh, when crowd are becoming uncontrollable. When crowd is uncontrollable, police usually resort to violence to prevent more fatalities from uh, happening. However, some observers think that the police often get overzealous when maintaining the peace. Many of these international standards are not met, not only on football, but also on how to deal with, with crowd, big crowd, whether it is stadium, whether it is election, whether it is a rally. Many of those standards have not been met by the Indonesian government. Thus, it should not be a shock to see the stampede in, in Malang. It happened not only in football, it happened in rally, it happened when dealing with street protests, it happened with other ethnic and religious tension. Police violence against uh, any sector of the society, of Indonesian society is incredibly commonplace and uh, the violence against the fans is just yet another uh, expression of this a uh, sense of um, invulnerability to public scrutiny. Following the October 1st stampede, a fact-finding team was tasked with investigating the cause of the tragedy. It found that the officers had employed excessive measures and had fired the tear gas indiscriminately. Just two weeks before the Kanjurahan tragedy, the police fired tear gas at rioting supporters. During a match in 2019, the police fired tear gas to prevent supporters from forcing entry to a stadium. And in 2012, one fan died after police fired tear gas at supporters in Surabaya, also in East Java. Faktanya demikian, bahwa polisi ikut terlibat dalam kekerasan sepak bola kita. Kenapa demikian? Karena polisi memang tugasnya adalah mengamankan setiap kegiatan-kegiatan di sosial kemasyarakatan. Tapi kemudian untuk di konteks sepak bola, polisi ternyata belum efektif untuk menjaga keamanan dan keselamatan para penonton sepak bola. Bahkan kadang-kadang menjadi pemicu terjadinya keributan di lapangan justru dari polisi dengan menggunakan pentungannya, dengan menggunakan tamengnya, atau juga dengan menggunakan gas air matanya. Dan itu fakta yang terjadi. But in this instance, steps had been taken to avoid disaster. Malang police had asked the organizer of Liga Satu, PT Liga Indonesia Baru, or PT Lib, to move the match from 8 p.m. to earlier in the afternoon. There were concerns that evacuation and crowd control would be difficult when it's dark. The police had also warned Arema FC not to sell tickets of more than the stadium's capacity of 38,000. In the end, 42,000 tickets were sold. There was also miscommunication between Indonesian football's governing body, also known as PSSI, and the police. PSSI juga punya masalah. Kenapa? Mereka tidak pernah mensosialisasikan kepada pihak kepolisian bahwa pertandingan sepak bola tidak boleh ada senjata eh, senjata api dan gas air mata. Tapi faktanya ada gas air mata dan senjata api di lapangan sepak bola. Ini kan sebenarnya melanggar aturan regulasi yang telah dibuat FIFA dalam uh, uh, Safety and Security Stadium Regulation Pasal 19 poin B. Bahkan tameng pun tidak boleh, pentungan tidak boleh, penutup muka untuk polisi pun tidak boleh masuk lapangan gitu atau atau terlihat di lapangan. Tapi faktanya ini terjadi di lapangan. Ini ada kesalahan dari PSSI. Following the investigations, PSSI fined Arema FC 250 million rupiah, around 16,000 US dollars. The Malang police chief was fired and nine other officers suspended. But this is scant consolation for Elmiati, who lost her family in the tragedy. Trauma, gitu, Pak. Saya lihat 
kayak di, kayak video-video yang terkait sama kejadian itu kayak kayak pengen marah sama pak polisinya tapi gimana sudah kejadian mau nggak terima itu gimana itu pak The Kanjuruhan Stadium tragedy is the latest in a string of football-related deaths in Indonesia. But some hope that it becomes a catalyst for the country to finally confront its toxic football culture. Mungkin, uh, mungkin ya, ini, dengan, dengan kejadian ini mudah-mudahan gak ada lagi nyawa yang melayang, yang hilang karena sepak bola. Namun perseteruan, kita boleh rivalitas, jangan sampai membunuh harapan saya itu saja. Satu nyawa sangat mahal ya, untuk kaitannya dengan sepak bola, apalagi sampai 135 orang meninggal dunia. Jangan sampai kemudian budaya menjadikan sepak bola ini menjadi kuburan, menjadi hal yang eh, apa namanya menjadi simbol, ikon sepak bola Indonesia. Ini kan akan menjadi masalah dan akan menjadi aib buat dunia. Ya. But there are systemic issues that need to be addressed before Indonesia can clean up its game. Indonesian football has a long-running struggle against corruption, rife at all levels of the game. Players, referees, team officials and the country's football association, PSSI's management, have all been accused of and some even convicted of match-fixing, bribery and embezzlement. But mother of three, Eka Wulandari, never thought she would be entangled in any of these. Jar, as she's known in the football community, is on the management committee of a League 3 club, Gresik Putra Paranane. Di tanggal 14 November 2021, satu hari menjelang pertandingan uh, NZR Sumbersari vs tim saya, tim Gestra Paranane itu saya ditelepon uh, oleh seseorang. Saya diminta untuk kalah 1-0 pada waktu itu. Saya menolak karena bagi saya uh, ini sangat tidak fair. Jadi saya agak kaget pas dia menawarkan seperti itu. Hal pertama yang saya lakukan adalah saya menolak. Ja has been in the football industry since 2014 and the treasurer of Gresik Putra Paranane for the past three years. Despite rejecting the bribe, she later found out that her players were enticed to throw away matches against NZR Sumbasari and Persema Malang in November 2021. She blew the whistle and filed a match-fixing report with the provincial chapter of PSSI. But when she was due to give her statement, she was attacked by assailants on motorcycles. Sisi kiri itu yang kenceng itu yang membuat saya uh, ketabrak itu sampai jatuh gitu. Dan jatuh di situ akhirnya saya tidak bisa memberikan keterangan di Polda Jatim untuk di hari Jumat karena saya ditabrak lari. Ja suffered serious injuries to her face, legs and arms with two of her teeth broken. Meanwhile, her husband, Awaludin, sustained bruises on his face, knees, shoulders and arms. Her assailants were later caught and sentenced to jail. They were believed to be working for a foreign gambling syndicate. This is just one example of how dangerous things can turn when one is in the crosshairs of the football mafia. The term refers to the collusion of a loose cadre of coaches, team owners and referees. Corruption is a pervasive problem in Indonesian football. In fact, in the past, there were football association chairperson, you know, sent to prison because of corruption. The, the thing is, it reflects the culture of corruption, the culture of taking bribe, the culture of blackmailing, the culture of of lowering standard in Indonesia. And this is not, not nothing new. It's been going on for decades. The Football Association, PSSI, has also been tainted by match-fixing allegations. One of its executive members was caught on tape trying to bribe a coach approximately 10,000 US dollars to throw a second division game. In 1998, 
15 PSSI referees were convicted of match fixing. In 2011, anti-graft watchdogs accused the PSSI management of siphoning 50.4 million US dollars from the state budget. PSSI was suspended in 2015 by the Ministry of Sports for disregarding its recommendations to ban troubled football clubs Persebaya Surabaya and Arema FC from participating in the Indonesia Super League. As a retaliation to the government's refusal to lift the suspension of the Football Federation, FIFA banned Indonesia from international competition for two years. There have also been allegations of footballers not being paid, as well as numerous deaths both on and off the pitch. Many of the allegations never resulted in a conviction, but the stain of corruption haunts the association. PSSI adalah suatu badan yang tidak sempurna, mas. Kita perlu masukan dari masyarakat, masukan dari pemerintah, dari pegiat bola, dari kompet, komentator, semuanya luar biasa memperhatikan PSSI saat ini. Kita menyadari PSSI bukan uh, sempurna. Jadi perlu ada kesalahan di sana sini tidak sempurna dalam pelaksanaan pasti kalau diteliti ya ada semuanya walaupun semua sudah berjalan sesuai alurnya. The perception of corruption sometimes translates to fan aggression. Supporters and players lash out when they feel the officiating is unfair. For example, in 2018, players attacked a referee in a League Two match after he awarded a suspicious penalty. Tapi aksi anarkisme supporter di lapangan pun itu tidak lepas dari lemahnya PSSI dalam menjalankan aturan. Misalnya ada pengaturan skor dan sebagainya sehingga supporter ketika datang ke lapangan mereka sudah tahu timnya akan kalah. Sehingga kemudian ketika faktanya di lapangan benar-benar kalah, akhirnya mereka kemudian melakukan aksi-aksi yang tidak dibenarkan di sepak bola, melakukan pelemparan botol, melakukan apa pengrusakan, pembakaran dan sebagainya. Violence in Indonesian football is partly linked to the perception of corruption at the top levels of the footballing bureaucracy. When these fans know that their club is being mismanaged by their own administrators, when the PSSE is being mismanaged by the uh, bureaucrats who have clearly have only their, you know, their wallets and their uh, political interests in mind, when they see decisions from the referee which are clearly favouring another team. So uh, these are highly volatile situations. But in in Indonesian football, it's always very difficult to, to blame anyone in particular. Along with allegations of corruption, PSSI have also been accused of mismanagement and having poor regulatory standards. When it came to the use of tear gas, which has been banned by FIFA at Kanjuruhan Stadium, the fact-finding team concluded that some blame has to be placed on PSSI. Akmal Mahali is part of the fact-finding team. PSSI juga punya masalah. Kenapa? Mereka tidak pernah mensosialisasikan kepada pihak kepolisian bahwa pertandingan sepak bola tidak boleh ada senjata eh, senjata api dan gas air mata. PSSI harusnya menyampaikan aturan-aturan ini. Nah, problem ini kan bukan terjadi di Kanjuruhan, di pertandingan lain pun sama. Di mana gas air mata masih masuk, senjata api masih masuk. Artinya ada aturan yang tidak disampaikan PSSI kepada pihak kepolisian dan ini sangat berbahaya sekali. The lax control was not limited to police arms. Supporters sometimes bring prohibited items into the stadium. Regulasi ada, tapi tidak dijalankan. Ini yang jadi problem. Misalnya tidak boleh bawa flare, tidak boleh dalam kondisi mabuk, kemudian tidak boleh membawa korek api, tidak boleh bawa senjata tajam, tidak boleh membawa benda-benda tumpul yang membahayakan. Tapi faktanya masih masuk lapangan. Artinya ada pembiaran-pembiaran terhadap problem yang harusnya tidak dilakukan oleh seorang supporter. Adding to the problem is that who is responsible for enforcing the rules isn't always clear. PSSI selaku regulator menyerahkan Liga 1 dan Liga 2 kepada LIB seraku operator. LIB tanggung jawabnya kemana? LIB bertanggung jawab menyelenggarakan kompetisi. LIB diserahkan pada klub. 
ada di dalam manualnya itu bahwa klub bertanggung jawab terhadap semua penyelenggaraan. Resiko, kecelakaan, dan lain-lain tanggung jawabnya klub. Kadang-kadang panpel di daerah itu pengamanannya kalah dengan yang di polisi. Dalam arti polisi ngomong ini harus begini, begini, harus nurut. Karena yang punya ketanggung jawab keamanan di daerah kepolisian. Ini, lah nanti ke depan ada pembagian tugasnya. And in the cases where clubs are in violation of safety rules, they may end up receiving just a slap on the wrist. Dan ditambah lagi kadang-kadang sudah tidak boleh main di laga kandang satu tahun. Setelah itu tiga bulan kemudian direvisi, dibolehkan lagi karena demi kepentingan uang. Nah ini yang sangat berbahaya ketika kemudian kebiasaan yang salah dibiarkan akhirnya menjadi tradisi yang membahayakan. With the problems plaguing Indonesian football so entrenched, what will it take to clean up the industry? Khusus kepada Kapolri, saya minta melakukan investigasi dan mengusut tuntas kasus ini. Untuk itu, saya juga memerintahkan PSSI untuk menghentikan sementara Liga 1 sampai evaluasi dan perbaikan prosedur pengamanan dilakukan. Saya menyesalkan terjadinya tragedi ini dan saya berharap ini adalah tragedi terakhir sepak bola di tanah air. After 135 deaths at Kanjurahan Stadium, the troubled football industry has finally caught the attention of the President. Uh, President Jokowi indeed asked for a review of football matches, football management in Indonesia. He also welcomed FIFA President to come to Jakarta. But I'm afraid the attention that he gave on this football problem is not enough. Well, of course, President Jokowi or his advisor can argue that there are too many things that he has, he has to handle from, you know, environmental destruction, economic problem, the war in Ukraine, uh, the G20 summit. But he should set up a team to advise him and to take real actions on the mismanagement of football matches in Indonesia and why Indonesia football national team could never compete at the World Cup final. Indonesia is set to host the FIFA Under-20 World Cup in May next year, the first FIFA tournament held in the country. If the world's fourth most populous nation wants to raise its profile on the world stage, football reform is key. So uh, basically uh, there are some reforms that uh, police need to perform, the professionalism, uh, that is very important. Police are responsible for maintaining security uh, in the Indonesia and then they've got regulations, they've got uh, manpower. So they are supposed to be uh, responsible in maintaining security. However, uh, there is also another problem, a uh, vicious uh, cycle of violence uh, due to soccer fanaticism by uh, Indonesia fans. I think that uh, this culture, uh, soccer fanaticism, that leads into aggressive behavior, uh, that results in violence, needs to be addressed. Some fans have taken it upon themselves to change the culture of violence that has crept into their beloved sport. Ini adalah rumah kami, Tribun Selatan Maguwarjo. Di sini kami bersorak, bernyanyi, dan hal-hal liar, liar yang kami lakukan di sini. Apapun untuk mendukung PSS Sleman. Racist and demeaning insults and chants are the norm in the stands at Indonesian football matches. But this ultra fan group sets itself apart from the rest. Bagong is a member of the Brigata Kurva Sud the fan club of League One team PSS Sleman. He has requested to have his identity hidden for privacy. Jadi kita tidak pernah fokus untuk 
mengejek tim lain, kita fokus ke PSS Sleman. Jadi kita tidak pernah memakai baju-baju rasis, kita tidak pernah memakai atribut yang merasisi mereka atau gimana. Tapi kita selalu membuat yang lebih mengenal untuk PSS Sleman. Kita fokusnya untuk PSS Sleman. PSS Sleman is from the special region of Yogyakarta. It has one of the largest fan followings of any football team in Indonesia. With approximately 400 communities registered and thousands more as independent members. The South Stand Brigade, or Brigata Kurva Sud's energy, can conjure an intense euphoria instead of an air of animosity and anarchy often experienced in heated football matches. In 2018, the team won the promotion to the first division. And it wasn't just the raucous support in the stands that helped the team achieve this. Thirty-one-year-old Damai, a driver, used to work at the Brigata Kurva Sud's merchandise shop. He is also requested for anonymity. Dulu, bisa dibilang PSS itu termasuk tim yang setiap musim itu selalu terseok-seok e, masalah prestasi finansial dan lain-lain. Jadi, e, mungkin mim uh, sebuah mimpi sih mas, mimpi, mimpi konyol mungkin teman-teman yang Piye sih, uh, gimana sih caranya kita bisa menghidupi, menghidupi sebuah tim Akhirnya beberapa teman-teman punya inisiatif untuk mendirikan sebuah toko merchandise kayak gini Yang tujuannya untuk menyisihkan royalti untuk kita sumbangkan atau kita berikan untuk tim yang kita dukung Ya mungkin kita nggak lihat nominalnya mas ya, cuma di situ menjadikan sebuah kampanye yang bagus buat kita selalu untuk memberi, membeli produk yang original di Corvasut Shop yang nantinya itu royalti kita berikan untuk Pak Sleman dan kita beberapa musim kita selalu logo kita toko kita itu selalu menempel di jersey PSS. The Brigata Kurva Sud fan club is trying to change the toxic fan culture that has plagued Indonesian football. Oke, okay, manifesto kami adalah satu Ramuntir, kedua Stil Solo, ketiga Mandiri Menghidupi, keempat No Politika, kelima No Leader Just Together, keenam No Tiket No Game, ketujuh Sebatas Pagar Tribun, dan kedelapan Awedes. The Brigata Kurva Sud are a fan group which have come to prominence over the last perhaps 10 to 15 years. They have been very active in promoting a kind of positive football uh, fan culture. The Brigada Kerber Sud have been very active in uh, making their stadium a more accommodating place to female fans. But in my reading, in terms of Indonesian football, there are, there are no angels in this sport, and there's no angels amongst the fan groups either. And they have also been involved in different uh, violent confrontations. So I always try and seek a, a balanced perspective on what's going on. As for fans of Persebaya and Arema, they put aside their decades old rivalry and came together to pay tribute to the victims of the Kanjuruhan disaster. This could be a small but important step on the long road to football reform. It's very difficult to reform uh, Indonesian, the management of football in Indonesia because the bureaucratic structure of football is so inextricably linked to uh, high level political interests. From my point of view, I think Indonesian football needs to be uh, reformed from the ground up. The police also need uh, help uh, from uh, fans associations, from even probably uh, teachers at school, they need to disseminate civility for uh, students, for youngsters when they are attending a match uh, in a stadium. Because there are already too many 
uh, victims uh, that resulted from uh, such violence. Kita harus mensosialisasikan kepada masyarakat bahwa sepak bola ini adalah hiburan, itu yang pertama. Sepak bola ini adalah tempat orang-orang uh, berekreasi di akhir pekan. Keluarga menikmati apa uh, hiburan lewat uh, aksi 11 lawan 11 di lapangan. Ketika itu dijalankan, maka semua pastinya akan menjadi enak dinikmati. Dan yang paling penting terakhir adalah supporter harus punya pemikiran bahwa mereka datang ke stadion buat nonton bola. Bukan untuk kegiatan-kegiatan lainnya, apalagi sampai punya pikiran untuk melakukan aksi anarkis. After the Kajuruhan Stadium tragedy, FIFA President Gianni Infantino met with President Jokowi and announced steps to facilitate Indonesia's preparation for the Under-20 World Cup next year. To reform football, because football has to be joy and happiness. If Indonesia wants to host more international footballing events beyond the 2023 tournament, the reforms will have to be taken seriously. And for lovers of the sport, they long to see the day Indonesia can shed its reputation as one of the most dangerous leagues in Asia. I hope and I'm sure that we all will learn that the organization will be much better and I see a brighter future for the Indonesia football. And I hope tragedy like that never happen anymore in the world of football. Kalau tidak mau berubah, ya kita harus menerima kenyataan bahwa sepak bola kita tidak akan pernah berprestasi. Sepak bola kita hanya memunculkan sensasi. Sepak bola kita hanya memunculkan kontroversi. Jadi jangan pernah berharap kita bisa jadi juara dunia kalau sisi-sisi yang harus dibenahi dibiarkan begitu saja. Itu sih sebenarnya. Jadi kalau kita tidak punya optimisme, maka kita jangan pernah berharap besar. Tapi kalau kita punya optimisme, ada harapan besar untuk sepak bola kita berkibar di internasional. Thank you.